My name is Johannes Bauer. I'm the director of the Crowell Center uh, for Media Information Policy. Welcome everybody to today's talk. Uh, certainly a very timely topic, uh, platform economics, possible futures. And we have two world renowned speakers uh, who have dealt with digital innovation, digital policy uh, and platforms more recently. Uh, at, at various levels and, uh, and have thought very deeply about those issues. Robin Mansell and, and Ed Steinmiller, I'll say a few things about them in a moment, but I'd like to emphasize that this is a an, an very important part, point in time to talk about platforms. And, and, and within a very short period of time, uh, uh, platforms have changed, uh, uh, the way we perceive platforms has changed. Uh, a few years ago, there were paragons of innovation. They would be agile companies uh, pushing forward the digital frontier. And within the last few years, the number of voices that see the dystopian aspects of platforms has increased, right? We talk about digital colonialism, we talk about surveillance capitalism, and most recently, uh, digital platforms have been uh, very quickly uh, in a response to, to riots and, and other uh, uh, events in the last few months and years, uh, been blamed for many of those social events. Uh, probably both pictures, the utopian and the dystopian are extreme cases and probably miss many of the points. Uh, policymakers have responded very quickly. The European Union in the last few years, at least the European Union I know, has, has numerous initiatives pending, including the Digital Services Act uh, that is in, in discussion in the parliament. Uh, there's antitrust investigations in the United States. Congress has a long uh, investigation of, of major platforms. I have sometimes have the sinking feeling that, 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 that the theoretical frames that we use to discuss those issues are less robust than we often wish. And so I'm very happy to have Ed and uh, Robin here today, who both have thought about this very deeply, very systematically, and recently published a book that I think is a very succinct and very deeply reflected uh, uh, treatise on, on the issues that we face uh, going forward. Robin. Uh, Mansell is a professor of new media and the internet in the Department of Media and Communication at the Lawrence School of Economics and Political Science. Uh, many of you know her also as a board member and secretary of TPRC. She was a past president of the International Association for Media and Communications Research, among other things. She has many, many honors. Uh, but in the interest of time, I will not mention all but one. She just recently picked up uh, an honorary doctor from the University of Freiburg. Uh, so congratulations to that one. Um, Ed Steinmüller uh, likewise is, 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 uh, has a long career and a long history in researching innovation. As I said before, he's the RM Phillips Professor of Economics of Innovation uh, at the Science Policy and affiliated with the Science Policy Research Unit at the University of Sussex probably one of the leading global centers on, on innovation uh, research and innovation policy research for many decades. Um, it's also like Robin uh, researches digital ecologies, um, fundamental social transformations and governance issues related to those. It's a great pleasure to welcome the two of you today here and uh, please take the floor over. Thank you, Johannes. Uh, we're very happy to be here. Both of us are going to speak today. Uh, I'm going to start. So that's us again <laughs> uh, and our cover slide. Uh, and this is the book that Johannes was referring to. Uh, it doesn't have the most sexy title in the world. Uh, it's called Advanced Introduction to Platform Economics. Uh, it's in a series, uh, the Elgar Advanced Introductions uh, in which our colleagues uh, a number uh, of other books in this series are well worth uh, looking at uh, as well. Uh, for example, Bengt Ock Lundvall has written one with co-authors on systems of innovation, uh, which is also uh, an interesting uh, work. So this is Robin and my second book project. Uh, our first one uh, was uh, very long, very heavy, uh, and not very uh, widely read. Uh, so this time around, we decided uh, we would go for something more concise uh, 
And indeed, this book is quite concise. Uh, we endeavor to cover the topics that you see here. Uh, and uh, we will talk uh, briefly about a, a few of them today. Uh, but there are other things, uh, such as the Global Perspectives chapter, which we can address in questions. Uh, but we aren't going to pre present that uh, today. What we are going to talk about, though, uh, is the uh, platform origins and novelty and this three theoretical accounts idea that uh, is a thread that goes through the book. Uh, you'll see what that means in a moment. And then Robin will talk about self-regulation and alternative business models uh, and something about proposed uh, regulatory interventions uh, in uh, the platform market. So to speak about platforms, uh, origins, novelty, and definitions, one of the chapters uh, in the book, um, uh, platforms are originating uh, in the increasing digital intermediation in our lives, which have uh, become an overweening fact of our lives uh, in the pandemic. Uh, but uh, even discounting that, they were becoming a very important thing uh, beginning uh, in the 90s uh, and extending uh, throughout the succeeding uh, decades. <clears throat> In the 90s, and even before that, uh, we also uh, were seeing user-produced content becoming very important, and platforms very much rely upon user-produced uh, content. Uh, and then more recently, uh, mobility, uh, so that our attachment, uh, our uh, nearly uh, symbiosis uh, with our mobile phones, uh, provides a very direct and intimate uh, interface to the, uh, to the world of the internet at virtually every hour of the day and night for many, many people. And the last element uh, of origins and novelty is uh, about uh, artificial intelligence. That's what the AI means uh, and how AI uh, supports uh, datification of your behavior uh, on the internet, how it turns your choices, your uh, activities into data that then becomes uh, able to be processed for uh, predictive and for influencing purposes. So with that basic picture, we come up with a working definition of platforms as a radical in innovation, one uh, that isn't just an incremental change on internet, but a fundamental uh, change, uh, which involves this new approach to supplying content desired by users. It implies a need for a business model to pay the cost of maintaining and improving the platform. And most commonly, this is advertising support, less commonly subscription. And it involves a very important element of collection, retention, and use of data about users to augment the value of advertising in commercial platforms or for non-commercial platforms uh, to improve uh, user services, which of course, uh, commercial platforms are interested in as well. An important auxiliary uh, feature of platforms uh, is commercial services such as Google AdSense. So many times when you're on the internet, you're providing data to Google, even though you're not on a Google page. That's because Google offers companies the ability uh, to gain, uh, well, what Shrizana Zuboff would call surveillance information or merely data on your uh, behavior uh, uh, by putting code on their sites. So in the book, our focus is on the largest platforms, uh, uh, Facebook, uh, Google, or its corporate name, Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, particularly iTunes, and Microsoft and its uh, MSN uh, network. So if we were to define one issue uh, that our book tries to 
uh, wrestle with or attack. Uh, it is the contest between economic and public values. So from an economic value perspective, uh, platforms provide services that users value. We know they value these services, not because in an ordinary way they pay for them, but because they use their time to connect to them rather than using their time in other activities. And the uh, platform's economic value uh, is a consequence of this contribution of time uh, and with it content uh, by users and the fact that a large number of users uh, are connecting to platforms and this is valued by users. So the larger the network, uh, the greater uh, the value of the network uh, to users. That's a, a frequently repeated uh, statement. It uh, isn't, in my regard, a, a fact of nature, but is uh, a tendency, a tendency uh, uh, that we tend to value uh, larger uh, networks. Um, so if those are the economic values, well, public values, and this is certainly a view of Western democracies, it's not necessarily uh, shared uh, by the political establishment in China, for example, uh, that uh, from a public value point, viewpoint, this whole development uh, of platforms has created harms that are multiple and unacceptable. So what are these harms? Uh, well, uh, if one uh, takes the view that uh, platforms scale uh, is part of the problem, uh, uh, that is related to the question of whether they foreclose alternatives. So all the major platforms have uh, uh, acquired companies uh, in the course of their growth, uh, companies that might have grown uh, larger and created a more competitive market. Uh, we have a less competitive market than we would have if those companies had grown. Of course, in a market economy, uh, we want to provide people with the ability to sell their interest in a company if the price is right. So these mergers that have occurred uh, are not because uh, Google or Microsoft stole companies, but because they paid uh, a premium price to acquire them, a premium sufficient to persuade the owners of the companies to sell to them. A second sort of harm uh, is this dis or misinformation uh, and hate speech, uh, which are particularly prominent, as Johannes mentioned in the introduction. Uh, and a third uh, uh, kind of harm uh, that people focus on is uh, surveillance and biases in data analytics. That phrase biases in data analytics uh, arises from the idea that artificial intelligence systems are often uh, influenced by the training uh, methods that are used uh, in order to create them. And the consequence of that uh, is that they reproduce the biases that are inherent within the training data. So if there's a collision here between economics and public values, how did this collision occur? Well, Probably the most important thing was the decision to immunize platform operators from liability for content provision. So when we decided to allow uh, Google, Facebook and other platform uh, producers to uh, put up content and take no responsibility uh, for whether it was uh, libelous, uh, that libelous responsibility was retained by the person posting it if they could be found, uh, not by the platform that posted it. This is a very different obligation, of course, uh, the newspaper publishers. 
A second feature is American absolutism regarding freedom of speech. So in Europe, we take a different view about uh, freedom of speech uh, uh, with the idea that some speech uh, uh, is actually contrary to uh, democratic ideals or social solidarity. Uh, for example, in Germany, uh, expressions related to outlawed parties are prohibited. From an American viewpoint, that is very problematic because it abridges uh, the idea, in fact, the constitutional amendment uh, guaranteeing freedom of speech. So we're not talking about shouting fire in a crowded theater here. We're talking about saying things uh, that are disruptive of uh, social solidarity. Uh, uh, and some places in the world are willing to uh, regulate that activity. And that is not the case uh, in the US. A third is this indifference to user privacy or privacy. The idea that uh, users can opt out and therefore if they opt in, uh, why isn't what they do subject to observation? We can post someone in the supermarket aisle and watch what the shoppers do. Why can't we post an observer uh, on the internet and watch what people do on the internet? So there's an indifference to user privacy. And finally, an assumed right of companies to create economic value as they choose. And that means that if uh, uh, Twitter or Facebook uh, wish to attract your attention by providing you with titillating or indeed uh, uh, very anger producing content, uh, if they can make money out of that, then uh, the assumed right of the company is to create economic uh, value. So these basic assumptions, which are, as you can see, intertwined with the way that business is done uh, in the modern world, uh, uh, have uh, uh, the effect of creating the collision between private and public uh, values. And the question about this we might ask is, who's going to set the rules and standards uh, for governing uh, the expressions, governing the business models, governing the industrial dynamics uh, in the future of evolution of platforms. China, United States, uh, um, Europe, uh, or some other uh, actor, although those are the most likely. So the book proceeds uh, using three theoretical accounts. Uh, First of all, uh, a very straightforward neoclassical economics approach in which plat platforms are intermediaries that are able to influence prices. Uh, we'd ordinarily as economists be concerned about uh, a company's ability to influence price. Uh, but in this case, uh, we might say that they are taking an innovative rent uh, for their cleverness in designing this a new business model. Uh, and it becomes a question as to whether that innovative rent is reasonably justified because of the innovation that they have created. And the traditional idea underlying antitrust is that you need to have a market definition. How do you define the market determines whether there is a market uh, uh, power operating or not. Uh, for example, whether uh, competition is indeed foreclosed through mergers, uh, uh, competition in what market? Now that basic perspective of neoclassical economics is quite permissive with regard to the operations. It's a very consistent with many of the economic kinds of arguments that I introduced in the previous slide. Uh, but 
uh, it does not address uh, uh, the formation of the rules governing the behavior of platforms. And for that, we really need to turn to a second perspective, institutional economics, which recognizes that market power can stem from imperfect rules. Uh, for example, the rule that uh, platforms are immunized from liability for the content that they provide. Uh, and a question of social values. Uh, uh, which we may see as requiring defense from opportunistic behavior. We say uh, this economic behavior is often opportunistic behavior from an institutional economics viewpoint. And institutional economics would then go further to ask how and why do values and expectations change, thereby the rules and ultimately uh, the structure and performance of industries. And then a third uh, theoretical account that we pull through the entire work is one based upon critical political economy. Uh, and this term uh, refers to the viewpoint that uh, capitalist, uh, uh, the capitalist system is basically one of uh, exploitation uh, and a critical political economy uh, perspective is one in which we see digital platforms uh, as something experienced by an exploited class uh, under capitalism uh, and what consequences that might have. And of course, this argument gets into the uh, issues like, uh, is, your, is the capture of your data uh, uh, or the data produced by observing you, uh, is that involuntary labor and capture of value by the platform companies. So when you take all of these three theoretical accounts uh, uh, and view uh, platforms uh, from uh, these different lenses, uh, it's uh, inescapable that commercial datafication is not a law of nature but rather a profit-seeking business strategy whose success is a consequence of the rules chosen. It's not inevitable uh, and it uh, can be changed. Uh, and that's where I will uh, stop. Uh, happy to answer questions uh, later, although I'm going to come back and talk about the conclusions and now proceed uh, to hear from Robin. Oops. Um, you might well imagine that in the process of writing this book, given those th three theoretical lenses that Ed just described, we had endless discussions. And I suppose in terms of an introductory, advanced introductory text, the whole purpose of writing it was to illuminate some of those discussions in the way that they play out when it comes to talking about platform uh, strategies. Uh, their own self-regulatory strategies, but also, um, as I'll come to in the next slide, the uh, external um, avenues for market intervention. Um, we don't have time for me to go through all of these points in any detail, but if you think about them as pinch points, areas where uh, the platforms themselves in terms of their own uh, strategies, business models and practices um, tend to um, operate in a way that is consistent with both their own um, interests, but is also giving rise to some of the harms that Ed was talking about in terms of public values. So the first one is uh, uh, strategic standardization. And here, I think what I would emphasize is uh, one area, it's not the only area at all, but in the area of data portability um, and the limitations they have set on that historically um, in order to carve out their market segment. Um, it, has made it very difficult to be able to talk sensibly and uh, reasonably in terms of um, implementation, uh, interoperability between platforms and therefore how to create an actual competitive marketplace. Um, they have also created standards of another kind, which is their decisions about whether or not users should be able to opt in um, to their services or opt out when it comes to data collection. So they leave users with relatively limited control, at least the commercial platforms do. 
Another area is um, the end user license arrangements, which uh, Richards and Herzog have called uh, pathology of consent in the sense that we all know and studies have demonstrated this empirically, that few people read their way through all of these agreements and therefore it is very difficult to talk about the informed consumer or citizen who goes online. Strategic content moderation, I'm sure, sure this might come up in um, questions later, so I won't go on about it, but basically self-defining uh, what is harmful and often illegal content um, is something which they have been permitted to do in the name of um, per, uh, a permissive market environment. Um, their responses, as we've seen, particularly over the last couple of years to um, either murmurings or actual efforts to introduce external uh, regulation and policy with regard to their businesses has resulted in escalating amounts of money spent on lobbying in the political realm and various kinds of delaying tactics. So while they may from time to time, uh, such as Facebook say, oh, we would welcome regulation. Anyone who has participated in various regulatory uh, proceedings over the decades in the media and communications field will know that this is not a straightforward thing. There is always a tension and a negotiation as to what kind of regulation, how can it be implemented and how can it be enforced? And then finally, um, you might be surprised to see ethical principles there. We put it here in the self-regulatory category, not because it's not relevant to external regulation and policy, but because the platforms themselves have been very concerned um, especially in the last, recent years, to introduce and to agree and to collaborate internationally on the development of ethical principles. Um, it, one of the main uh, questions in that area is regardless of what those principles are, what the words say, what does it actually mean in terms of transparency and accountability for anyone outside the platforms? And in addition, with the advances in artificial intelligence and particularly unsupervised uh, machine learning, um, methods, uh, what does it actually mean to talk about transparency and explainability of an algorithm? Um, so in, in the book, we take the three different lenses and we drive them through each of those different issue areas to see what where you end up. Um, and it's quite intriguing, you often end up in different places. Hence, the debate that goes on in the policy environment, because it's very difficult to reach a consensus on these points as to what should be done. Next slide, please. Um, coming to the, the issue of uh, external regulation and how on earth one begins to think about accountability of the platforms insofar as uh, there is a wide consensus that something must be done about some of the harms and by harms I mean um, issues around pr privacy, issues around non-discrimination when it comes to the role of uh, data and algorithms and their outputs and also freedom of expression. Um, alongside the corporate right to um, implement its, its business practices. Uh, how, do, how do we envisage and how do the different theories uh, tackle some of the issues in real time and what we are beginning to see, and in some countries there has already been implementation, is a mix of self or co-regulatory um, actions plus um, ex ante oversight is being considered um, to a greater degree than perhaps it was in the past. As Ed said, uh, we allowed these platforms to grow because in the name of innovation and um, openness. And we are now at a kind of a, a critical juncture, if you like, uh, where it may be uh, that um, ex ante regulatory oversight, even though mistakes can be made, becomes more of a norm in the Western democracies such as in the case of the European um, recent um, digital services uh, package that's been um, proposed. Um, what we also see uh, outside of the regulatory area is competition policy and antitrust proceedings. Um, and we know that in the United States and in Europe, um, cases are being brought, um, more and more of them just recently. Um, I heard in another session I was in today that um, apparently one of the Google uh, cases that's been brought in the United States is not scheduled to begin until 2023 and not scheduled to begin to end until 2026. 
So if we're looking to antitrust and some of the discussion about breaking up the platforms in order to stimulate greater competition, we're going to be waiting for quite some time. And in the meantime, we all know that there are quite serious problems to deal with. Another um, area that is discussed is from time to time, though not always acted upon, is actually banning some of the AI enabled datafication practices, particularly in sensitive areas, whether it be in politics or whether it be in content directed at children. Um, and uh, this is a really difficult area um, because on the one hand, there will be those who argue we don't want to slow down innovation. And in addition, some of those innovations do bring benefits. But on the other hand, um, they can bring substantial disbenefits. Take the case of uh, police use of facial recognition technology, for example. Um, also, what we see uh, is relatively little investment in alternative business models. Ed mentioned uh, the preponderance of the uh, advertising driven model, but there are other models that could be considered. And in fact, some exist on a, a relatively low ebb. So clubs and voluntary kinds of associations. Uh, we're all familiar with Wikipedia, Wikipedia and in addition, Wiki News. Um, but remember, one of the criteria for thinking about platforms is how do they generate revenues to generate the cost, uh, to cover the cost of doing business and to improving the quality of their services. Um, it's not always clear when it comes to voluntary associations. Subscription models certainly um, are doing quite well in some areas, uh, particularly in streaming video, etc. But um, they have a tendency to segment and this becomes an issue when you're talking about whether or not there's a coherent public sphere for debate. Um, and then we have public service media, which is uh, has a variable history in different uh, countries, particularly uh, in the Western world and has various financing models. And in addition, depends very much in terms of whether people approve of it and whether, whether the state is distant or close to that public service model and is able to influence it. And lastly, I would highlight um, the uh, endemic weaknesses in uh, investing in what you might call digital or data literacy. I say endemic because although Increasingly, we find texts in legislation and in regulation, particularly in the UK, Ofcom has for a long time had um, in legislation the obligation to invest in uh, uh, literacies, uh, media literacies, as they call them. Uh, the amount of money that goes into this and the amount of um, discussion about what that actually means, particularly in an AI enabled world, um, is so uh, weak compared to the amount of investment that goes into pushing forward the boundaries of the leading edge applications and technologies. And so you have a mismatch in terms of the assumption that is made in some economic theories that the consumer is able to take rational choices as to how they are going to participate at, on platforms and indeed to protect themselves from any um, harms. So we'll stop there. Ed. You want to conclude? We want to leave some time for questions. Yes. <clears throat> Apologies, we're running a little bit over here, particularly because of me. <laughs> so I'll try to be very brief here in conclusion. Uh, so uh, we can think about the road ahead as involving codes of good behavior, the possibility, but as Robin pointed out, uh, a very protracted process to come up with antitrust solutions. Uh, they're unlikely to curtail the basic business model of platforms, uh, which I think, and I believe Robin believes as well, will continue to be largely seen as inevitable. Uh, we're gonna change the rules of the game, uh, but whether this will extend to eliminate immunity for publication of content remains to be seen. It's not at all clear that that will be uh, a path chosen. Uh, we're also going to see a further development of open data initiatives and a continual wrangling over what constitutes uh, data that should be private. What is your data? As I earlier suggested, uh, when you're observed in the supermarket, data is gathered about you. Uh, and that is not seen as problematic. Is observing your behavior on the internet problematic? Exactly in what way? 
that becomes the question for data ownership, data privacy uh, kinds of questions. And finally, increased surveillance is likely uh, notwithstanding limiting legislation. Uh, it's possible to learn lots about groups of people uh, without identifying them individually. It's possible to learn a lot about behavior without focusing on uh, individual behavior. Uh, 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 and uh, to use this with uh, predictive machine learning uh, to influence choice behavior and to nudge people to do things that you wish them to do, including uh, buying uh, the latest product that you want to offer uh, to the market. 